Good morning again. Good morning. If I, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Danny, and I'm uh, just grateful to get to share with you this morning. And this is my, this is my son, Bo. He's, uh, he'll be, he's gonna be 11 months tomorrow. Yeah, we're, we're kind of grieving that because he's not a little baby anymore. Um, but the reason I brought him up here is this morning we're gonna, we're, we're talking about Christmas, and we're talking about babies, and um, the reality is that if I set Bo down right now, this guitar is no longer safe, <laughs> right? Um, these lights and this garland are no longer safe. He is no longer safe because there is a massive ledge here that he would likely experiment with. <laughs> um, and he is an amazing little boy, and he's vulnerable. He is completely reliant on our care. He is completely reliant on somebody to make sure that he is safe. He's got the, like, he, he's certainly checking you all out and trying, you know, he's got the stranger danger going on. And the reality of Christmas is that Jesus, the creator of the universe, the creator of humanity, became like this at Christmas time. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can come together and we can worship you, we can praise you. And God, thank you that you sent your son for us. You spared no expense. And Jesus, thank you for becoming like a little child and taking on all the vulnerability that comes with that for us. We love you, and it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Do you want to wave and say bye, bud? No, no chance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the Gospels are many things. There are many things, but one of the things that they are is a biography. They tell the story of Jesus' life. They uh, talk about uh, the events of his life, and it's where we learn the most about him. And three of the four of them talk about the birth of Jesus. John is very poetic. I feel like we sort of sang John 1.1, 1, 1, in Jesus you alone. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made without nothing Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then down in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Luke is a bit more pragmatic. In Luke chapter 2, he says, While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Matthew, as uh, Christy talked about last week, is a little bit more focused on the family. It goes through the genealogy. It, uh, it talks more about the tension that Mary and Joseph felt, particularly from Joseph's perspective, and it talks about their incredible trust despite the absolute upside-down beginning of their marriage. Matthew chapter 1 highlights it, but in verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, biblical authors were very intentional with what they wrote. They didn't take up time or space to spell out common uh, experience, um, and so one of the things that we know about the Bible is that it's, des it's designed to be meditated on. I was listening to uh, an interview with N.T. Wright this week. He's a scholar, a New Testament scholar, and he's, been, uh, he's written like 80 books. It's ridiculous. He actually doesn't even, he couldn't keep count uh, when they asked. He's like, I think it's about 80. But in the interview, he wrote this new book on Romans 8, and he said, for the first time, I saw this. And it was amazing to me. This guy studies the Bible professionally for like 40 years, and he saw this new thing. The Bible is this amazing thing. Um, and as Tim Mackey says from the Bible Project, he says it's designed to be meditated on for a lifetime. And the reason I say this is because if we drill into specific words or phrases in these chapters or these verses or these books, some of these stories have incredible depth and meaning to them. And so it's our goal in this series to consider the, the honesty of Advent, the humanity of Christmas. And so today we're going to pause and we're going to stare at three words in particular, she gave birth. If you could imagine for a moment 
that this was a hyperlink, right? Like she gave birth if they were the blue letters with an underline and you could click on it and it would take you to the transcript of everything that occurred in those three words and everything that those three words encompassed. Would it change the story at all for you? Because everybody in here has experienced birth, whether it was simply you were born, but many of you have given birth, many of you have witnessed birth, Many of you would say, I, it doesn't really, like, I don't really feel anything when I think about birth. But because I've talked with many of you, I know that there are also many of you who feel a lot of joy and a lot of great memories of, of birth. But then there are others of you who would say, when you think about it, it's hard. It's painful to think about that idea. Or for many of you, it may even bring up a sense of loss or uh, an unfulfilled longing. And so even in our own just quick reflection on our own feeling about those three words, we would acknowledge that those three words are much more than just three words. For us, uh, Monica and I, we are so grateful to have four healthy kids. And um, relatively, as, as much as pregnancy is normal and deliveries are normal, they were, those four were relatively normal. But in each of them, there was a moment where we weren't sure, right? Like that confidence dipped down. And so in our youngest, Bo, at, uh, at the very last minute, he came out face up, which caused a lot of chaos right at the end. The doctors got very uh, concerned right at the end. Our third, her oxygen dopped, uh, dropped during labor, and Monica had to be on oxygen, and like there was a very clear sense of urgency among the doctors. Our second, uh, Monica had to be on bed rest with him and was in extreme pain, even more so than what is, again, what, whatever normal is. Um, in, in delivering the child. And then with our first, uh, her pregnancy was considered high risk. And we had to go to all sorts of extra appointments. At the end, we had to do stress tests. Um, but in the end, we're grateful to have four healthy children and, and their incredible blessings. But before all that, we didn't have a healthy pregnancy. Um, uh, everything was fine for the first trimester and everything was looking good. And then uh, somewhere right around the second trimester, started to having, having some complications, and the doctor was like, yeah, everything's going to be fine, I just need to go on bed rest and, you know, take it easy. Um, and th the short version of the story is everything was not fine, and we lost that baby about halfway through the pregnancy and um, almost lost Monica in the process of that. Um, I practiced this a hundred times, and I didn't think it would be emotional, but it is, but... Um, Watching my wife give birth to a lifeless child was the hardest thing I've ever, ever had to do. And <clears throat> it was at that point that my paradigm of, this is a 25-year-old young man's paradigm of, yeah, like, a woman gets pregnant, labor starts, and a baby comes out. It's not that simple. It is much more vulnerable than that. It's much more fragile than that. It's much more complicated than that. And so she gave birth. Three words. Three words in two chapters of an entire book of the Bible have incredible depth and meaning because birth is vulnerable. It's literally messy. It's complicated. It's stressful. It's painful. And it's always traumatic to some extent. And this is part of the honesty of Christmas. Now, from decades of research in neurology and embryology, psychology, we know so much more about birth today than, than the ancient people did. We know that the, um, the conditions of the pregnancy have incredible impact on the health of the child. We know that consciousness begins in the womb. One author writes, we have known for years that drugs, alcohol, nicotine, poor nutrition, and certain infections in mom can drastically affect the unborn baby altering DNA and genetic expression, as well as physical, mental, and emotional development. What mom eats, drinks, breathes, thinks, feels, and experiences goes right to the baby. So do her stress hormones. Truly, our experience in the womb has impact on the rest of our lives. Now, we know this now. Matthew and Luke, who wrote she gave birth, probably didn't. But the God of the universe, the creator of the process, certainly did. He's not surprised by our scientific findings in 2023. He knew all of this. And as Dale talked about the background of the story a few weeks ago, Mary's pregnancy was not without stress. They were forced from their home. They faced the rejection of family and friends, the traveling, knowing that, that labor was imminent. 
let alone the fear if the baby would even make it in a time where historians estimate that infant mortality was close to 50%. The creator of the universe submitted himself to the reality of the womb. This place that's simultaneously safe and utterly dependent. Now we also know that the few moments of the baby traveling from the womb down the birthing canal and into the world has lasting impact years beyond those couple of moments. The same author writes, we are learning that trauma from high impact experiences during childbirth is not only stored as nonverbal memories within newborns, it impacts their life at a critical time in their development, affecting short and long-term physical and mental health. Their entire neurological system, from their learning capacity to mental orientation, emotional stability, and stress management. The fight or flight stress response creates a strong memory in babies and leads to similar responses, to similar cues, until resolved in their nervous system. Just those couple of moments have a lasting impact for years beyond those moments. And again, we're still learning about this as research continues to come out, but the God of the universe, the creator of the process, knew this all along. Now, we don't have a video record of Jesus' birth, but everything we do know is that those moments were not the ideal of scenario. It was just Mary and Joseph. There's no medical team, right? They're not in a hospital or even in a bed. Jesus wasn't laid onto a warming table with warming lights and all of the, like, monitor things that babies get laid into now to make sure that they're okay. He wasn't even wrapped maybe in clean blankets. But modern research is clear that the transition into the world is incredibly traumatic and shocking for newborns, and that's within the confines of a modern hospital. Imagine how shocking it was for the infant Jesus, who was born in a place where animals are kept and laid in a feeding trough. Again, Jesus knew the risks when he came. He knew the risks of the birthing process, and he still submitted himself to it. So my question for you is, if Jesus was willing to submit himself to that, if he was willing to take on all the risk, all the vulnerability, what else is he willing to take on? Uh, my grandpa, who passed away a couple years ago, he taught me to play golf. He taught me how to love golf. He taught me everything about golf. We built golf clubs together. We played all sorts of golf courses together. I have a ton of amazing memories with him. And uh, whenever we would play golf, if I would ever, this was rare, but if I would ever get a par on the first hole, he would always say to me, you can't par them all unless you par the first. And now I say that to my friends, but that rarely happens either. None of them are here yet, but I'll, I'll make the joke in second service. But the reality is that Jesus could have come um, as a 30-year-old man. He could have come fully developed. He could have come fully independent, fully grown. But the reality is he couldn't have experienced the, re the fullness of the human experience without experience experiencing how it starts. You can't experience it all if you don't experience the start. And Paul says it like this, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So if Jesus, God in human likeness, was willing to submit himself to the risk, to the mess, to the vulnerability of childbirth, let alone the complete dependency of childhood. Like Jesus wore diapers, right? He's for sure willing to enter into the rest of the mess of humanity. This is the mess that you and I wade through every day. It's the broken and struggling relationships. It's the self-doubt. It's the anxiety. It's the temptation. It's the fear. It's the pain. It's the sorrow, it's the longing, it's the disappointment. And those three words, she gave birth, they set the tone for the rest of Jesus' story. And this is why the words that Matthew uses in chapter one are so important. Because the name Jesus was common. Lots of people were named Jesus. But Matthew says, Emmanuel, and this links back to the prophecy of Isaiah that isn't used for anyone else. There's no other Jesus, there's no other person who is called Emmanuel. And as he says, it means God with us. And see, Matthew frames the whole story of Jesus with this idea of God with us from the beginning to the end. Starting from before he's born in Matthew 1, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
But if you look at the last thing that Matthew records Jesus saying after, after he's risen to new life and he's about to ascend back to heaven, in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus who came into the world through the mess and the risk and vulnerability of human birth as an infant was born just like we were. He experienced the fullness of humanity from childhood to adulthood, just like we do. And he's with us. Not at a distance, but up close. And Jesus has always been present in the mess of humanity, and that's the hope of Christmas, that he continues to be Emmanuel, God with us. I want to take a little bit of time just for a moment to talk about this idea that she gave birth as part of a bigger concept called the Incarnation. And the incarnation, if we wanted to boil it down into just a couple of words, is simply God comes in. God broke through into our world, like Christy talked about last week, through the womb of a faithful and obedient teenage girl. One world broke into another world. Now, this is a unique claim to Christianity. There's no other claim like it in all of religion. And I want to just take a minute to to, to look at that, because um, Eastern religions would say that the incarnation is unnecessary, They would say that God is already in us and that gods are everywhere. And actually, salvation is just reframing our consciousness to realize that. The Christian and biblical perspective, however, is that there is a separation from God's world and our world. It goes back to the beginning. In Genesis 1 and 2, humans live together with God. It says they dwell with God. They walk together with God. But in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sin, which causes a separation between God and humans. It says it like this. Verse 23, so the Lord God banished him from the garden and e- garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. There's a very real and literal separation that starts in Genesis 3. But even if you don't believe in the Bible, even if you would say you don't believe in God, one of the things that, that would acknowledge that there's a there's a separation, is our, our whole concept of justice. Why do we know, or how do we know, that injustice is wrong? Quite simply, if you long for justice, if you long for things to be right, it's an acknowledgement that there's something other than what we experience here. Why do we long for a place where people don't die? If this place is all there is, why do we long for it to be different? Because deep down, everyone knows that there is an ideal that is different from the real that we experience every single day. And so in response to the incarnation being unnecessary, the Christian view would be that God's world isn't here. Western religions like Judaism and Islam would say that the incarnation is impossible. They would say, they would agree that God's world is apart from ours, but they would say God is too powerful to become a baby. God is is too big to ever come down to a Jewish teenager. I would say that the idea of the incarnation is too primitive. But the Christian response to this is, what could be greater than a God who's willing to come down to and for his creation? What could be greater than someone who's willing to humble himself for his creation and become like them? It's like an adult getting down on the floor to play with a little kid. The little kid can't come up to receive the love and the care that they need and that they desire The power rests solely on the adult to go down and express that love and affection and to meet their need. And so what could be greater, what could be a greater expression of love and power than coming down in humility? No other God takes on human flesh. There is no greater display of majesty and power than God becoming one of us. The doctrine of the incarnation says that the powerful became powerless. The untouchable became holdable. The all-knowing became teachable. The eternal became finite. The invincible became vulnerable. God became human. There is no other claim in all of religion like this, and it is incredible. Tim Keller once said, if you don't believe the incarnation, it's not because it's too primitive. The only logical reason to not believe it is that it's too good to be true. Because the implications and the promises of the Incarnation are incredible. If you believe the doctrine of the Incarnation, that God comes in, that Mary gave birth to Jesus, 
and Jesus became one of us, it changes literally everything. But because we're looking at the birth of Jesus and the just sheer mess of birth, I wanted to look at one thing that the doctrine of the incarnation revolutionizes, and that's the, that's the mess of suffering. Um, I love Christmas. I love the music. I love the carols. Uh, I love dec- mostly love decorations. Um, I love how excited my kids get. Uh, I love the excuse to make special recipes and food. I don't eat a ton of treats, but I love that like this season there's pretty much a treat within arm's reach at any given time. Um, I might even like go to Starbucks and get one of their peppermint mochas or something just because. Uh, but a couple years ago, and, and I don't remember ever feeling this way before, but a couple years ago, I just didn't like Christmas. I, like, I, I, I just didn't like it. I was ready to get on to New Year's. And, and as I reflected on it, like the disconnect of the perfection of the retail holiday, holiday like the decorations in stores, all the lights, all the things on the like, light posts down the downtown and all that stuff, the happy music, but paired with the reality that there are wars going on, there are people dying, there are people who are sick, there are natural disasters wreaking havoc, let alone my own experience. And then like, what really topped it off was like, under one of those signs that says like peace and then the next one that says joy, there's somebody honking and flipping this other person off because they're not backing out of their spot fast enough. Like, I cannot reconcile all of this. So that's my own issue. I've worked through it. <laughs> um, but, it but that particular year was hard for me. And the reality is, regardless of what you believe about God, the biggest problem that we have to deal with is the problem of evil and suffering. And there are multiple options to choose from. It's a massive spectrum. On one side, you have the belief, like, if, if, if you don't believe in God, this perspective would typically say that there's no purpose behind suffering, so why worry about it? Richard Dawkins, who's uh, one of the uh, famous atheists, says, he says it like this. Well, actually, he was asked about his worldview, but I wanted to tell you what his worldview is first. He says, in a u- universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. And so when he was asked how he feels about this, he says, I don't feel depressed about it, but if somebody does, that's their problem. Maybe the logic is deeply pessimistic, the universe is bleak, cold, and empty, but so what? That's this option. On the other side of the spectrum, even if you don't believe in the Christian God, you just believe in a higher power, maybe. Generic God, higher power. The question you have to wrestle with is, why doesn't that powerful being stop suffering and evil? Or why can't they stop suffering and evil? So you've got these options, but the view of the incarnate God says, our God hates suffering so much, and he loves us so much, that he was willing to leave his space, enter into ours, and by experiencing him, the suffering himself, will one day destroy it forever. Peter says it like this in 1 Peter, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The incarnate God says, I'm going to pay the penalty myself, and that will one day destroy death, suffering, evil, and pain once and for all. And in the meantime, It'll give comfort and purpose. (laughs) She gave birth, and the broader doctrine of incarnation says you have a God who has experienced what you have or are experiencing, which means you can go through pain knowing that it's temporary because the God who broke through and became like you loves you, and he's been there, and one day in this lifetime or the next, he's going to take it away. Which leads to the last thing. Last question is, why does she give birth? Why do those three words, why does that give hope for the future? Paul draws on this same analogy in his letter to the Galatians. And the Galatians are an early church, they're early followers of Jesus, and he's begging them to follow and hold fast to the truth and to follow the way of Jesus. He says it like this in Galatians 4.19, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. Paul is saying, just as God broke down the barrier between his space and ours, 
just as he broke through the wall of separation and formed Jesus in Mary. He broke through, and she gave birth, and it changed everything. And in the same way, it's still possible that God can break through the walls that we put up, the walls that say, I can do this on my own, the walls that keep our space and his space separated. And Paul is saying he can still break through those walls, and Jesus can be formed in you, and it can change everything. See, the doctrine of incarnation says the only way to, go, to uh, overcome suffering is to go through it, but it also says because Christ is in you, anything can happen. And the honesty of Advent is that right now it's partial. When Jesus came as a baby, he made the reality of transformation possible, the reality of hope possible, the reality of restoration and healing possible. But on the other hand of Advent, we're reminded that one day he'll come back and it will be complete. And between the resurrection and the formation of the church, the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts, Jesus, this is, it's this time where Jesus ascends back to heaven. And Luke records what happens. He says, an angel appears, or he, before he says it, there's an angel who appears as they're literally watching Jesus drift into the clouds, which is incredible, by the way. That's a message in and of itself. Those are three words we could dig in on. But he writes in Acts 1.11, the angel says to them, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will, be, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And the reality of Advent is that she gave birth and Jesus came, but the longing of Advent is that he's coming again. And when he comes back, Revelation 21 says what he's going to bring. He's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth where God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things that we experience every single day right now has passed away. The separation that began in Genesis 3 will be undone, and the beauty and the int intimacy and the perfection will be restored. And this is how we can reconnect the perfection and the beauty of the retail holiday and the mess and the vulnerability of she gave birth. The beauty and the decorations, the thrill of the presence, the happiness of the music, the joy of the treats, they don't have to feel like a disconnect from the reality of our experience. They can serve as a reminder or a signpost, if you will, that not only did Christ come as the most wonderful gift, and not only does he walk with us now, but he's coming back. And when he comes back, it's not going to be through the miraculous but vulnerable way of childbirth. He's coming back in an even more miraculous glory and power and majesty and full authority to make everything right. And while we wait, she gave birth reminds us that Jesus came as one of us, for us. Author Scott Erickson, who you hear a lot on the podcast, wrote this. A saving way came into the world just like we did, in all its goopy humanity. A birth is a rite of passage in human vulnerability. The Christ was born of blood like we are. The Christ partook in the powerless vulnerability of coming into the world naked and weak like we often still feel. That the Christ was born into the muck of human biology which we seem to wade through for the rest of our lives. So my hope is that this Christmas, that she gave birth would remind us that he came as one of us, for us. And the invitation of the doctrine of incarnation is that anything is now possible. What I'd like to do as we close is just to take a moment to reflect, and, and then we'll respond in a minute. But what I'd like to do is just read the part of Luke 2. And I invite you to close your eyes and just listen. <laughs> Not that the story has to be different to you now, but, but maybe it will be a little bit. And so I'm going to read, starting in verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about.